The concept of moles in chemistry is famously difficult to explain and understand. A mole is an amount of something, so you might say, I have a mole of carbon dioxide, or I have a mole of glucose. And you can see why it's a difficult concept to explain if you just look at the definition of the mole. So by definition, a mole is 6.0221476 times 10 to the 23 particles or things. In other words, if you have 602 sextillion, 214 quintillion, and 76 quadrillion things, then you have a mole of those things. So I guess we understand what a mole is now, except like, why is it that and how do I use it? It's a really opaque definition. We need to get to the bottom of the purpose of the mole. And actually, I think moles fall into a category of things that are difficult to explain and understand until you first look at the problem that that thing solves, and then it becomes really easy. The offside rule is another example. Maybe I'll explain the offside rule at the end of this video as well. But for now, we're going to look at moles. So by the end of this video, you will really understand moles. So what problem does the mole solve for chemists? Well, chemists like reacting things together. So maybe they've got some hydrogen over here and some fluorine over here. They want to react them together to make hydrogen fluoride. But they want to do it in such a way that there's nothing left over. There's no residual hydrogen. There's no residual fluorine. How do you achieve that? Well, you start by looking at the chemical equation. And you can see from this chemical equation here, hydrogen plus fluorine goes to hydrogen fluoride. By the way, this isn't a realistic chemical reaction. This is a, a simplified view of the process that is instructive for this explanation. But anyway, you've got one of each thing and they join together to create a molecule that has one of each thing in it. It's very simple. So you need the exact same number of hydrogens and fluorines. How do you do that? you could count them out. So you could count out a trillion hydrogens and a trillion fluorines. You know you've got the same amount of both. There'll be nothing left over if you react them together. But that's impractical. So you could do what chemists always do, which is to weigh out the different chemicals. So you weigh out one gram of hydrogen and one gram of fluorine, and you've got the same amount of both. Except that doesn't work because fluorine atoms are heavier than hydrogen atoms. So if you've got one gram of each, you'll have more hydrogen atoms than fluorine atoms. So what you have to do is look up the relative masses of hydrogen and fluorine. And when you do that, you find that fluorine is 19 times heavier than hydrogen. Like if you were going to react single atoms together, so you've got one atom of hydrogen, one atom of fluorine, the ratio of the masses in that chemical reaction would be 19 to 1. And so long as you keep that mass ratio the same, you know you'll have the same number of hydrogens as you do fluorines. So for example, if you've got one gram of hydrogen, you'll need 19 grams of fluorine. Or you could do two grams of hydrogen and 38 grams of fluorine. Or you could do 10 ounces of hydrogen and 190 ounces of fluorine. So long as the ratio is 1 to 19, you know you'll have the same number of atoms in each pile. So how do we know that an atom of fluorine is 19 times heavier than an atom of hydrogen? Well, most of the mass of an atom is in the nucleus because the electrons are so incredibly light. So we just need to look inside the nucleus and see what's there. For hydrogen, the nucleus is just a proton, one proton. So we could say that the mass of hydrogen is equivalent to one proton. On. Or to use the proper jargon, we talk about atomic mass units. So we would say that hydrogen has an atomic mass of one. I'm oversimplifying slightly, which I'll clear up at the end, but go with it for now. If you look inside the nucleus of fluorine, it has nine protons and 10 neutrons. So it has an atomic mass of 19. Well, so far, our imaginary chemist hasn't come up against anything particularly challenging. That's for two reasons. The first reason is that the chemical reaction is really simple. You've got two atoms going in, you've got one molecule coming out, and that molecule is made of one of each of the atoms. The second reason is that one of the chemicals going in is hydrogen, and that has an atomic mass of one, which makes the mathematics really easy. 
In reality, chemical reactions are usually much more complicated than that. For example, the chemicals going in won't be atoms, they'll be molecules. And the results of the chemical reaction might be more complicated, like it'll have six of one thing and two of the other, which makes the mathematics more complicated. So let's imagine a slightly more complicated scenario. This time, let's look at beryllium oxide. Here's the chemical equation for it. Again, this isn't how you make beryllium oxide. It's a summary view. It's still really simple, but now the masses are more interesting. So if we were to react a single atom of beryllium and a single atom of oxygen, what would the ratio of the masses be? Well, oxygen has an atomic mass of 16, beryllium has an atomic mass of 9, so the ratio is 16 to 9, which is why I call this chemical the widescreen chemical. <laughs> So when you're reacting single atoms together, the ratio of the masses is 16 to 9. And so long as you keep that mass ratio the same, you'll have the same number of both atoms and you won't have anything left over after the chemical reaction takes place. That's called a stoichiometric ratio, by the way. So a sensible choice might be to have 16 grams of oxygen and 9 grams of beryllium. This logic works for molecules as well, by the way. So if the chemicals going into your reaction are molecules, you just count up the number of protons and neutrons in the molecule and that gives you the atomic mass of the molecule. And so chemistry proceeds in this way. Whenever a chemist wants to react some things together, they work out the atomic mass of those things and they get that much of the stuff but in grams or kilograms or whatever or tenths of grams or tens of kilograms. So you can imagine chemists having conversations like this. How much oxygen have you got there? Well, you know the atomic mass of oxygen? Well, that, but in grams. Mm. Uh, how much hydrogen have you got there? Well, you know the atomic mass of hydrogen? Well, that, but in grams. Well, actually double that, because I'm making water. So for every oxygen, you know, you've got to do. So that carries on for a number of years. And then I imagine some clever chemist comes along and says, do you know what? Instead of every time saying, you know the atomic mass of X, well, that, but in grams, why don't we just say moles? So you say, I have a mole of sodium chloride, I have a mole of oxygen. And we all just agree that when you say that, what you mean is, you know the atomic mass of that thing, well that, but in grams. So for example, aluminium has an atomic mass of 27, so if you've got 27 grams of aluminium, you have one mole of aluminium. And it just makes everything a lot easier. Like you can look at any chemical equation and just go, so I clearly need one mole of this, three moles of this, and I'll get two moles of this. Then when it comes to actually doing the chemical reaction, you just look up the atomic masses of the chemicals going in, you get that much of the chemicals in grams, and you know you have the perfect ratio of chemicals. You might be thinking at this point that the definition I just gave you of the mole is really different to the stated definition that I gave at the start of the video with that really big number in it. I'll get to that in a second, but first I want to talk about the simplification that I made earlier. I said that hydrogen has an atomic mass of 1, oxygen has an atomic mass of 16. That's not quite true. For example, hydrogen has an atomic mass of uh, 1.008. Oxygen has an atomic mass of 15.999. They're all a little bit off from whole numbers. The reason for that, well, there's two reasons. The first is relativity. We know from relativity that energy has mass e equals mc squared, and the bonds between protons and neutrons contain energy, and that energy has some mass. The second reason is isotopes. So hydrogen is usually one proton with an electron going around it. That's the vast majority of hydrogen. But occasionally you get hydrogen that where the nucleus is a proton and a neutron. That's called deuterium. There's a tiny amount of that occurring naturally on Earth. So if you want to say what the atomic mass of naturally occurring hydrogen is, you need to take into account the tiny amount of hydrogen that is actually deuterium. That's not just true for hydrogen, of course. Other atoms have different isotopes as well. And because the atomic mass of atoms deviates slightly from just counting the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, we need to be really careful to properly formally define atomic mass units. So you could, for example, say, okay, by definition, one proton on its own, not bonded to anything else, has an exact atomic mass of one. 
and then everything else is based on that. For some reason, scientists decided not to do that. They went with carbon instead, maybe because it's easier to measure, it's more abundant, something like that. So the formal definition of atomic mass units is one atomic mass unit is equal to a twelfth of the mass of carbon-12, where carbon-12 is the isotope of carbon that has six protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Which is why an older definition of the mole was the amount of atoms in 12 grams of the carbon isotope carbon-12, which arguably is even more confusing. How does that relate to the modern definition with that huge number in it? Well, if you define atomic mass units as a twelfth of the mass of carbon-12, you don't actually need to know the absolute mass of one of those atomic mass units. You don't need to know what it is in grams or kilograms or anything like that. You don't need that information. You can carry on just comparing the atomic mass units of different chemicals and then weigh out moles of those things and proceed with your chemical reactions with confidence. But as we became better scientists, we were able to eventually work out the absolute mass of a proton or the absolute mass of an atomic mass unit and it's some tiny fraction of a gram and so from that point you can work out how many atomic mass units there are in a gram and that's the huge number. It's called Avogadro's number. And so now we've come full circle. If you measure out a gram of something that has an atomic mass of one then you will have an Avogadro's number of that thing. Generally the use of moles is confined to chemistry but you could use it for other things. For example there is one micro mole of sand grains on the earth. I have a drawer in my house with half a mole of cables in it. I said I'd also explain the offside drawer and I have, it's in a separate video, it's a Patreon exclusive, link to my Patreon page in the details. I've been using Brilliant.org for a couple of years now, so I'm really pleased to say they're back again sponsoring one of my videos. If you don't know already, Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app with a real hands-on approach. It's got over 60 courses in maths and science and computer science. I feel like I've been using Brilliant more during lockdown, which makes no sense really because I have less time. Maybe it's just my way of coping. You know, they are really satisfying. Like if you haven't played with it already, they're really satisfying to do. Like the, the, the progression of difficulty within the courses is just right. You get, it's a series of like, yes, moments as you're solving these different puzzles. Really interactive, sliding things around, writing bits of code, all sorts of stuff. As well as the courses, they've got these daily challenges. Actually, maybe that's why I'm doing it so much. Because so the daily challenges are always really fun things like logic or uh, you know some weird maths puzzle like you know uh, geometry thing or something like that. But it's always a launch pad into a full blown course if you want to do that. So I end up doing the courses as well. For example, I accidentally know quite a lot about artificial intelligence now, and it's a really good kind of knowledge because the best way to learn is by doing, and that's what Brilliant.org has. You're actually working through the puzzles, not just watching videos. By the way, related to this video, they've got a course on chemistry. It's really good, lots of interactive stuff. So if that's what you're into, check that out as well. Membership gets you access to absolutely everything for just $7.99 a month. They've got a free trial as well. And because they're sponsoring this video, the first 200 people to go to brilliant.org forward slash Steve Mould will get 20% off should they choose to become a member. So check out Brilliant today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye.